How's everybody doing today? We good? That time of worship was incredible. Funny enough, the topic of uh, my message today is about worship. So that was a great intro to that. We've been in this series called Captivated, which as I've sat with this message, like I've really thought about that word because we're leading this series up into the 50th anniversary. And obviously Chris just mentioned a lot of that, kind of what we're going to do and all the things it's about. But it's crazy to me when I think about how this, this church body has been here for 50 years And one thing that's been the same, like I was not here, I was obviously not here in 1972, okay? But I do know that the 24 years I have existed on this earth and that I have been participating at and been here at this church body, one thing that I've recognized is that it has always been so captivated by the presence of God. Like in everything that we've done, every, every, we've been Fellowship of Christians, we are now City Church, but the heart has always been the same. It's been central around the presence of God. And I believe that captivated in worship, they go hand in hand, because if you're captivated by the presence of Jesus, then naturally you're just going to begin to worship him in everything that you do. We've been talking about presence and people and places. Um, I think we have a, oh, Caleb, not that graphic, a different one. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Stupid jokes. <laughs> uh, yeah, y'all knew the first one real well, Chris. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so Stupid. So we get centralized with the presence of God in everything that we do because the heart behind this logo is that we, we're centralized when we worship him, when we align ourselves with his spirit, then the presence of God fills us and it changes us. And whenever we walk into the different spheres of life that we have access to, there are people around us that their hearts begin to change and they notice that something's different about us too. And then when we walk with other people and those people begin to understand what the presence of God is, what it's like, what it means to walk and carry this authority, then it starts to affect every place that we go. It affects our our house. It affects the workplace that we walk into and our family and our friends. Anywhere that we go, the presence of God captivates us. Our theme verses we've gone through this is John 6, verses 64 through 69. And I'm just gonna read it. If y'all would actually stand with me, we're gonna read this together. It says this, and this is after a time where Jesus has actually been talking, and he says, you know, if you really want to follow me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. (laughs) I don't know about you guys, but if I was kind of around and wasn't one of the 12 disciples, I might have been like, all right, Jesus, like, it's been good up until this point, but I'm I'm out on that one because that sounds a little wild. That, That sounds crazy. But what he says after that is, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you, Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Y'all can be seated. That's good. And you know what? I've spoken about Peter quite a bit. And he does not get it right very often. He, in fact, he probably gets it wrong more than he gets it right. But I think in this moment where he said, Lord, like, where else would I go? Like, I'm so captivated by your presence. I want to be with you every single place that I walk. And and we love you. And you're the one that holds the keys to eternal life. So, like, why would we leave? He understood what that meant. Because Jesus is the bread of life. That's what he meant when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He said, I'm the bread of life. You're gonna be consumed with me like I'm gonna be what provides for you forever. So trust me, believe in me. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this theme of Captivated. I thank you for this topic of worship and what it means, what it's meant in my life, what it's meant to so many people here. And I even thank you for this time of worship, like with musical instruments and voices that we've been able to sing out our praises to you. I pray that we can just continue in this time that you would reveal to us what you would want to say. We would have open ears and we'd move forward. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So many of us here, like you hear that word worship, and if you're like me, what you probably think of is maybe what just happened, or you think of something musical. Like, and that's true because even the word worship, you hear the word worship team or worship band or the praise band or the praise team. And I believe that's a huge part of what we do. Like there's a reason that we do that every Sunday when we gather here with believers. 
and we praise him. And, and I would even say that in the Old Testament, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And inhabits, if you think of a habitat, it just means that you're living within that thing. And so God enjoys hearing our praises to him. Does he have to have it? Does he necessarily need it? I mean, no, he's God. But I bet he so loves and enjoys when he can inhabit the praises of his people. When he hears those things. You know, there have been times in my life, one of the first times I ever felt like I really, truly encountered the Holy Spirit. I was in, I think, middle school, junior high age. I was at a church camp, and there was, there was a worship team playing, and I can't remember this song, but I remember being so captivated by the presence of God in the room that night that I just bowed down on my knees and I just started crying. I said, God, like, I'll do anything. Like, I want to follow you. You're the one I love. You're the one I trust. I want to worship you with everything in me. And I just cried out to him. And that, I don't know that that would have happened in the same way had it not been in a congregational setting where there was a worship team and there, the centralized focus was on the presence of God that night. And it affected me and it changed me forever. And when we see in Revelations, when there are literally elders around the throne and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That is literally their job. They just stand around, they, they're bowing and they're worshiping and they worship and they continue to do so forever by day and by night. So what that tells me is that worship is not just a Sunday morning moment, right? It's not just the praise team and that's a big part of it, but that's not it. Because if it were just about the Sunday morning, then that would mean we wouldn't have to do anything else for the rest of the week. You know, I even think of a, if you had an incredible meal on a Sunday afternoon, right? You go home and you just eat something that maybe it fills you up for the rest of the day. It was an incredible meal, but then Monday comes and Tuesday and Wednesday and the rest of the week. And if you expected that meal to last you through the rest of the week, that would not be a very healthy or good way to live. That's just the truth of the matter is worship on Sunday morning can be a good reset, a good refocus time, but there's got to be something that lasts us throughout the rest of the week. There's got to be something. So the Hebrew word for, for worship, like as I was studying it this week, is the word shaka or shaha. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I am a southern boy from Arkansas, so I know I'm not saying this exactly how it's supposed to be said. But it literally translates as it means to bow down or even to lie down in the presence of God. In the Old Testament where this is first mentioned, Abraham recognizes the presence of God and his first reaction is he gets on his knees and he recognizes that the presence of God is greater than anything that's going on and he lies down before him because he's so captivated by what's going on. He knows he's supposed to bow down. I believe that we have to understand our posture before we can even begin to worship our God. We have to know that he's greater. As he becomes greater, we become less. As our heart is postured before him, we have to be in a place where we can receive, and sometimes that means getting down on our knees. Sometimes it means just changing your heart to say, like, Lord, I try to do it myself, because I can tell you I do that all the time. I try to do it myself, and I try to walk, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know all these things about God, but I can do it myself. Like, I feel empowered. I can do it. But I have to posture my heart in a way where I understand that he becomes more and I become less. You see people raise their hands, maybe when they're praying or they're worshiping God, and you might be like, what, what's the reason? Like, why do, we, why do we do this? It doesn't matter if you're here in Russellville, Arkansas, or you're somewhere way across the world. This is a universal sign of what? Surrender, Yes. And I know we know that, but it's so good to be reminded because when we surrender ourselves, we're in a place of reverence and humbling ourselves before a king. I'm going to talk about how worship is a lifestyle, but first we have to understand that we have to be in a posture where we can receive from God. Chris mentioned this verse last week, but I think about Peter and John when they were walking and the scripture is so funny to me because it's like, yeah, these were just ordinary guys. You could tell they weren't probably the brightest and they didn't have everything going for them. But they were recognized as people who had been spending time with Jesus. I would love if, you know, I was, as I got older and I kind of had lived my life, if people said about me, man, he, I rec every time I saw him, I could tell that he was someone who had been with Jesus. Like that's what matters when we talk about presence in people and places 
we have to be centralized in the presence of God. You know, I believe that worship is, is sacrificial. As we were praising and we were worshiping earlier together, we talked about this sacrifice of praise or this sacrifice of worship. Like four chapters after they talk about that shaha bowing down, worshiping God, one of the first instances that God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. If you know that story, Abraham is going along and he's worshiping God and he says, God says to him, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac, which is a big thing to ask. And he was testing Abraham. He was testing his faith. So when Abraham turns to his servants, he says, hey, stay here with the donkey. Stay here with all the animals while I and the boy go up there on the mountain. We will worship and then we will come back to you. I think it's so interesting that he says we will worship. He didn't say, hey, there's going to be a sacrifice or a burnt offering. He says, we're going to go worship and then we're going to come back to you. Because those terms worship and sacrifice are synonymous. In the Old Testament, if you remember, you had, to, you had to give something up to God. You had to give a burnt offering or something that meant something to you to encounter his presence. And then we see in the New Testament, we have that parallel, right, where Jesus is the ultimate lamb that was slain on the cross. He was the one that paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we no longer had to give him those things. We no, we no longer had to give him a burnt offering. Can you imagine having to kill an animal every single time you wanted to encounter the presence of God? Like, I'm so glad and I'm so grateful that Jesus died on the cross and paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. You know, but that doesn't just exempt us from anything because there's still some sacrifice that takes place in our heart. Earlier, Andy was saying, we sacrifice our praise to you, God. Because when we come into covenant with him, we start to sacrifice our old ways of living. The old man is now dead, and we have a new way. We have a new encounter. Sometimes we sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our comfort. We sacrifice our praises before him. Because ultimately, we believe that Jesus is worthy of our sacrifice. And I believe it's, it's a beautiful exchange because sometimes you just think you're, you're hounding this word, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. But he loves us in return when we worship him. We don't serve a dead God or an idol that we worship that we really get nothing. Like he, he loves us so deeply in return. The beautiful exchange of this is that it's not transactional, but it's actually relational. You're not giving so you can get something. He's saying this is not a contract that I need you to sign. He's saying, you're coming into covenant with me so that we can be together forever. We can be in relationship. I'm so grateful that I serve a God where it's not a contract, but it's a covenant. Because he loves you so much. He's so desperate that you would be in that place and that sacrifice of worship before him. You know, I also believe that worship is actually an elevation. It elevates your view above the thing that's going on in front of you. When we begin to worship, it's like it's something that's so different. You know, I had a vision as I was praying the past couple weeks about this message, and I felt like I saw myself on ground level, like six, seven, eight versions of myself. One was frustrated. One was just crying. One was anxious. One was worried. One was, you know, just all these different emotions. And then I finally, it's almost like I, I kind of stepped out for a second. I was looking at all these different versions of myself. And I looked and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to start to pray. I'm just going to pray. And when I began to pray, it's like Jesus and I were together and we just started ascending and being elevated above all the stuff that was going on below. Now, now know that I didn't say it just went away magically. Every single problem and issue that I had would stop. But when I got in the presence of Jesus and I prayed and trusted him, we were elevated. It was like we were going up in one of those glass elevators, those cool ones at a hotel or on a cruise ship where you can look down and you see everybody else below you. And you just begin to ascend above the problem. It's like I was sitting there with him and we were just thinking and, and we're just kind of laughing and looking down. And I imagine Jesus with a really sweet beard. We're just like stroking our beards together. Like, yeah, like that's crazy what's going on. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I trust you, Jesus. Like, it was so comforting knowing that he was, he had his cool the whole time. Like, I'm over here freaking out down here. But as I began to pray, it was elevated, and I was looking down and saying, Jesus, I know that you're with me in the middle of this, and I trust you. 
You know, there's a story of, of Peter in Matthew 14 where he's, he's walking. He tries to walk on the water. Caleb, I think we actually have those scriptures. Should be in Matthew 14. It says, after, this is Jesus talking. It says, after he dismissed him, them, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Oh, I said that already. It's about to read it again. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. It's funny to me that they say, truly, like after all these other things that you did, but this time, Jesus, it really is you. Like, I trust you this time. It just took a little bit of extra, you know, dramatic wind and waves. And they're like, okay, yeah, I think it really is you this time, Jesus. You know, I believe that the, the second, we know this story. So the second that Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus, what happens? He begins to sink. And I think that's something that we can all see in this story. Like, you know, the message is, man, keep your eyes on Jesus and you won't, and you won't sink and you won't fall. But something interesting also is that the storm didn't stop until after they got back into the boat. You know, because it would have made a lot of sense if Jesus had just been like, hey, you know what? I want Peter to feel a lot more comfortable when he's walking toward me. So I'm going to like make the wind and the waves calm down for a second. Hey, Peter, come on out to me. Like, it's good now. Like the wind and the waves are calmed down. Like you should feel better now. Like, trust me. You know, but it's not about your storm. It's about finding Jesus in the middle of it. Right? Because when you lock eyes with Jesus and you align yourself in the presence of God and you begin to worship him, all of those other fears and insecurities and doubts and worries, it's not that they just disappear, but they become less and less because we're so focused on Jesus' eyes. He's not saying, hey, I'm going to make all these things stop. I'm not going to make you go through anything difficult. I'm not going to take away your He's not saying he's going to take away the storms, but he is saying, if you trust me, I will elevate you above these problems, and, and you can give that to me, and I will take care of it. Lock eyes with me and trust me. Worshiping God looks like casting your cares and worries upon Jesus. If you had to write it out on a list, Chris has used this visual before, I love it. You write it down on a list and you hand it to Jesus. And I believe what he does is he looks at it, he crumples it up, and he just throws it behind him and he embraces you. He's got it. He loves you. And I believe worship is a lifestyle. It's how we love, it's how we interact. It's how we serve other people. You know, in 2 Peter, it would say, we're not, we don't just serve because we want to lead people or watch things over people grudgingly, but it's because we're eager to serve God. I think about the verse where, where Jesus says, I was thirsty and you brought me something to eat. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. Disciples said, Jesus, we didn't do any of those things. Like, that did not happen. But he says, as surely as you did this for these brothers and sisters of mine, you also did for me. I think about when opportunities arise where we can serve, where we can help. I even think about what happened recently at Oakland Heights where we had a grandparents day and so many of you went and volunteered your time and just sat with kids who didn't have grandparents, who just needed someone to listen to them and laugh with them and be in relationship with them for that short time when they had lunch. Sometimes doing these things requires a little bit of sacrifice and, and laying ourselves down and saying, God, I want to posture myself before you. And these insecurities or these doubts that I have, God, I know that if I trust you and I worship you and I put you centralized that I'll be elevated above these problems and it's going to be okay. And when I walk out this lifestyle, I know that I'm eager to serve you. I don't just do these things because I, oh, man, I've, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. Like, someone's going to get mad at me if I don't go serve and help at the church thing, you know, this week. And no one's saying that 
you know, when your coworker is going through something, your coworker needs help, are we eager to serve? Are we eager to help them? Or are we the ones that are kind of like, oh, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that one. Like, I don't, I don't know if I want to help with that. You know, my, my work is at work, and after that, like, I'm done with work. Right? There are opportunities that arise that the Lord would say, are you eager to serve other people? Do we love God and do we love others? I believe it means being sensitive to God's voice. Did you guys know that you don't have to be in your quiet time to hear the voice of God? And please do not misunderstand me because it is, we all need a quiet time. Like wherever that place is with Jesus that you get silent and quiet and you just listen to his voice, like find that place. Don't hear me wrong. But when you live a lifestyle of worship and you carry his presence everywhere that you go, he is constantly speaking to you. So many testimonies and stories that I've heard, people are just receptive to hearing God's voice in the moment. And again, it might be uncomfortable. It might be like, "Ah, I don't know. But we live a lifestyle of worship. It means being sensitive to what he's telling you and what he's saying. Can you imagine being at drive through prayer and someone needing prayer and you just, you want a word from God and then telling them like, hey, okay, give me like 10 minutes. Let me go be by myself and then I'll get right back with you about what God's saying. You go over here and then you pray for your 10 minutes and okay, I think I've got something. That's, that's not how, it, I hope that's not how it works. I hope that's not what happens. It's, okay, Cody says no. That doesn't happen at drive through prayer. If we're receptive to his voice and we understand that we carry his presence everywhere that we go, we live a lifestyle of worship so that we can speak life into people on the go. We can speak life at our workplace, at our job. We can speak life at the church body and when we're at a basketball game, when we're hanging out at a friend's house, whatever it might be, because we are carriers of his presence. The two places I think I spend the most time, and I think a lot of you would agree if you're, if you're still working, is you're most of the time at your house or you're at your workplace. Those are the two places that in my mind I'm like, yep, I'm at these places a lot. So my question is, what is worshiping God? What would that look like at my job? Okay, because I've got a job to do. I can't just get in my quiet time for eight hours a day when I've got, you know, 25 middle school kids per period that I have to tend to. We can't just have a little worship session right now. So my question would be, is everything that you do at your workplace done unto the Lord? Do we do everything unto him? And this could be if you're working with people, if you work alone, if you, if you don't work at all. Regardless, is everything that you do serving and pleasing unto God? Do you do it unto the Lord? Do you do it with excellence? Do you utilize this gift and this skill that he's given you? If you do work around a lot of people, my question would be, do I have positive interactions with my coworkers? Am I an embodiment of the kingdom of God? When I interact with my coworkers, do I love them well? Am I eager to serve them? Because I know that's the heart of God. Jesus put himself last so other people would be elevated first. That's the lifestyle. That's the model that I want to be a part of. Another question is, and this one might be a little harsh, do people like you at work? I know that sounds really mean, but that, my question, the reason I say it, do people like you at work? Because in my mind, if you are worshiping God as a lifestyle, the fruits of the Spirit should be pouring out of you at all times. And I'm not saying we don't have bad days. Trust me, I have, I have bad days. But the more that we worship God, the more that we become like him and the more drawn to his character we are. So when you walk into your workplace, do you carry the peace of God? Do you carry joy? Do other people recognize that on you? Do people enjoy being around you because these qualities and these characteristics of Jesus are all over you and you can't hide it? Like once you know Jesus and you're in relationship with him in this covenant and you're centralized around the presence of God, it affects the people that you work with, and it affects the places that you work in. If you're a boss, and you lead other people, do your employees enjoy working for you? What's the atmosphere like where you work? Is it lively? Is it, is it fun? Is it enjoyable? Is it, are the fruits of the Spirit being poured out in your, in your workplace as well? Because I can tell you this, especially as a teacher, People don't listen or learn from people they don't like. 
Got real quiet in here. It's the truth. And this is, I promise you, this is something for my life as well. It's the people, it's hard to really captivate someone and be captivated and, and get their hearts and really love them well if they don't listen to you. But you know what? They're not going to listen and learn from you if they don't enjoy being around you. And I'm not talking about people pleasing. I'm talking about embodying the characteristics of Jesus, the one that we serve. We talked about the workplace. Now let's talk about our house because that's the other place that we're at all the time. Practically, what does worshiping God look like at my home? Well, let me ask this. How do I love my family? How do I treat my spouse? How do I treat my, if you have kids, how do you treat my kids? If you are a kid, how do you treat your siblings? How do you treat your parents? My question also would be, what is the spiritual climate or what's the spiritual atmosphere of my house? What do people feel when they walk into my house? Because I can tell you, looking out in this congregation, I've been to so many of your houses, and there are people that, like, I can point out. There are so many people I could point out about the things and the way and the welcoming presence that I get when I walk into their home. You know, I think about people like Kevin and Nancy Heckler. When you walk into their house, it's so hospitable. There's so much peace that dwells where they live, and when people walk into that, it's like there's a shift. If I pull up to Carl and Becky's house and we're having a worship night and we're just around the fire, like it's like you, you walk up and it's like, oh, it feels good. Like it's something different. You know, you walk into the Abington's house, it might not be as quiet as those other houses, <laughs> but it's so joyful. Anytime I've walked into their house, it's like, man, the, the, the presence of God just dwells here because there's so much joy. When you lay your life down, before Jesus and you choose to worship him every day, I think those things just naturally happen. Like what do people say, what do people think when they walk into your house? When you invite another couple over, when you're hanging out and you're having fun and a good time, like is the presence of God tangible? Is the presence of God there when you invite people over to your house? I could have the worship, well, just Steph, if you could come up here and play keys, that'd be great, thanks. <laughs> Something that sits true for me, like when I think about my testimony and I think about stories that there were one scripture and there were one story that I could point to and be like, man, that is, that is for me 100%. It's the story of Mary and Martha in Luke 10. When we talk about this topic of worship, this is what comes in my mind. And it says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had, taken, that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. That sits true in my life because I can't tell you how many times I, it's like I want to please God. I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to serve, and I'm just going to do a lot of things for you because I feel like it will impress you, maybe. Or maybe you'll love me more. If I can fill my plate up as big as it can possibly be, then maybe I, you'll just be so pleased and so happy with me. You know, if we're not like Mary in this story and we don't find that intimate time to worship Jesus, I believe that we lose sight of him so quickly. We have to go straight back to the source. If we're walking in our life and we truly wanna live this lifestyle of worship where we, we're, we're sacrificing things and we lay things down, I don't know what that looks like for you. For me, a lot of times it looks like putting this thing down. It means sacrificing a little bit of that time because for some reason there is so much need to consume as much. It's For me, it's like I need to consume as much as possible, like all the media, all the things. I want to know everything when it comes out. I want to be able to tell everybody. I want to be able to talk about it. I've got to soak up as much knowledge as I can, and it's like I'm filling my brain to the max with honestly things that are useless probably and, and worthless. And I wanna also make myself as busy as possible 
Because if I'm as busy as possible doing good things, then that's gonna be pleasing to God. And that's what he's gonna appreciate. But what he says in this story is that Mary has got it right, where she's just sitting at his feet. When I first read this scripture, I was like, God, this can't be. Like, Martha's the one doing all the work and she's just sitting there. Like, I think about, I'm the older brother in my family, so I think about, like, I'm doing all the work. Nicholas and Caleb just sitting here doing nothing. In my mind, that's what I think of. I think that's why I can so closely relate to this story, but he says, no, she's got it right. She's found the thing that's important and it's the presence of Jesus. You know, maybe for some of us, it's time to say no to some things. Like maybe it's, it's time to start saying no. Maybe you're doing too much and this concept of worship, it feels like, yeah, I know God. I do worship God, I love him and I serve him. But getting back to that place where you can just be at his feet, you can be in that place of worship where you're bowing down and you're posturing your heart before him and you're centered in the presence of God. Maybe it's time to say no to some things. Maybe for some of us, it's actually time to say yes to some things. Those things that revolve around Jesus those things that maybe he's pushing you out of your comfort zone. He's saying, hey, worship is, is sacrifice. Like there's some things that maybe you need to lay down right now because I want you to be at my feet. Sometimes it's so easy to make our life and our walk about the thing going on in front of us. It's so easy, like we were talking about with Peter, it's so easy to make it about the storm. But what Jesus says is if you would come to me, I will give you rest. I will, you can trust me with your issues and your problems and I will walk you through it. Did you know that just loving Jesus and spending time with him is so pleasing to him? Did you know that there's nothing that you could possibly do to ever make him love you more than he already does? If you're like the Martha in this story and you're just serving and serving and you're doing, and I'm not even talking about church, like I just mean you're working yourself over and over and you continue to push and push and push. There's nothing more you can do to make him love you more. He loves you so desperately right now. In fact, he would just say, sit at my feet and worship me. Just be with me because this is a relationship. I want to speak to you and I want to hear what you have to say. He values what we say so much. There's so many enemies of worship that would try to get in the way, that would try to distract us, that would try to vie for our attention. Whatever that thing might be in your life, maybe it's time to sacrifice. Do you guys know that we actually have access to the spiritual realm when we begin to pray? that these things going on in front of us, a lot of times we make it about the flesh and blood and all these things, but it would say, actually, no, these wicked and evil rulers and principalities, you have access into the spiritual realm where you can turn those things a full 180 and have access to the presence of God where you walk. Those things that are in front of you, they're really not just earthly things. There's something going on in the spiritual realm. And when we, we gather this concept of worship as a lifestyle, we now have access to it. The enemy, like Chris said this last week, the enemy is always taking cheap shots. I even think about that graphic. Like if you're in, if you're in the middle and you've got three walls around you, like and you are trusting the presence of God, it's gonna be so much harder for the enemy to hit you. If you put on the armor of God, we can trust him. If we could have the altar team come up at this time. Church, let's just stand and pray together. Thank you, Jesus. You know, these people are here every week because they would love to pray with you. If there's something that's been stirred in your heart today, when it comes to worshiping God, maybe it's time to say no to some things. Maybe it's time to step up and say yes to some things. Maybe he's, 
he's convicting you right now. Maybe he's, he's just wanting you to come back to his feet and just sit and worship. I don't know what that looks like for you, but if you need prayer, please don't leave this place without coming up. Let's close our eyes together and pray. Lord, we thank you that you've been here all morning. I thank you that you have lived out a life that was so perfect and something that we can look at and we can, we can be a part of. We join with Christ. Lord, we sacrifice of ourselves and we say, Lord, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. We understand that this is relational. Lord, I pray that we understand this morning that your love is so much greater than anything that we could have ever known, that you just love when we spend time with you. In that intimate place where we worship you, Lord, I pray that we can find that. If we've been in a place where we have neglected that lately, I pray that this would encourage us to get back to that place. I pray that as we live out this lifestyle of worship, Lord, it begins to affect our house. It affects the people that we love the most that are closest to us. It begins to affect those people around us that we encounter every single day. And it begins to impact the places that we walk into. You're so worthy of our praise. So this morning we give it all to you and we trust that this week as you lead us, we will just begin to trust you. We will lock eyes with you and understand that when we're in the presence of God, we can follow behind you and you will lead us in every situation. There's no fear in love. Bless us, Lord, for the rest of the week. I pray that you would give people boldness and faith and that we would find this lifestyle of worship before you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.